got you into football in the first place and were you always as passionate about it as you are now? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I grew up in Ghana, um, so football is in my blood, basically. You know, we play football everywhere and anywhere. You know, play, play, play football barefoot. You know, we used to make footballs and put plastic and paper in a sock, roll the sock up, play. You know, um, we just play. You know, some balls where, you know, you remember we used to have these footballs where, like, it was plastic and it was quite soft. There was one hard area that you just didn't want to hit because that would just hurt your feet. So, you know, I just sort of takes it back. You know, I remember many occasions where, for example, you know, I remember one occasion where I'd, I'd hurt my leg um, badly because like, I cut my leg. But in the night, you know, typical Africa, African style, you know, got a um, hot knife, put butter on it, melted the butter into that saw, killed the cells. The next day, you're out playing football again. It just, I've always been involved, in, just always played it, really. Uh, I moved to the UK when I was 11. Um, and once again, play football for school, for Basingstoke Town, like the youth team, you know, college. You know, even when after I left college, I went back to play for them still. So just always been involved in it. UK, America, always yeah. been involved in it. Yeah, it's my blood, really. Hmm. It sounds like it, definitely. Yeah. Um, and why do you think that um, engaging in sports such as football is beneficial for your mental health as well as your physical health? Um, well, we know the benefits on the physical side in terms of developing your strength, endurance, flexibility, aerobic, anaerobic, strength, all that, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think the mental side is perhaps it wasn't as obvious, but it's becoming more prevalent um, as we get more education on it. But, you know, it gives the opportunity to develop, you know, individual skills, resilience, perseverance, you know, learning to win, learning to lose, the yes. so, social skills, uh, which I think is becoming increasingly important. The ability to be able to connect with people, to ask the right questions, to be able to, you know, mm. communicate. Um, you know, and, and these are skills that I think can carry on through, you know, through life. Um, and the resilience aspect of it all, you know, we know about kids these days and how maybe they're a little bit softer than we were, where, you know, they're a little bit more kind of, fragile um uh, but sport can help you kind of develop that because yeah. you know you, you win you lose and you have to learn to, to deal with things so it, it has huge benefits all across um you know, that you mentioned and that can affect us and support us in our future lives our future way of doing stuff yeah um yeah I, th I think as well like with football being like a team-based culture you kind of you kind of builds your confidence up and makes you feel like you're part of something and that's good for you mentally as well yeah, I think so too. I think, you know, definitely team sports are, key, are, you know, are very, very important. You know, individual sports are good as well for developing that discipline and everything. But, you know, I always say all sport is good sport. Just you know, yeah. play sport, just get out and do something because you learn something that you won't learn by sitting at home watching TV or being on a computer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, definitely. And do you think that football is inclusive and accessible enough? And if not, what would you say the barriers still were? I think depending on where you are and your social standing, um, if you've got a bit of money or whatever, then it is inclusive enough. Or if you are yeah. in the UK, I think the football provision in the UK is a lot more inclusive. You know, mm. it's definitely cheaper or there's more opportunities to go and play, to just take a ball to the local park and play. Whereas in the UAE, it's it's almost like a like a business, if you like. Right. Um, maybe not as inclusive because if you have less money, mm. you know, you, you can't just go and do something because everything costs money. You know, to join a club, to, to rent a pitch, all that stuff costs money. But, you know, the, the flip side is that the um, the disposable income in the UAE is also higher. So people are expected to have that basic amount to be able to do sport. So it's, it's different. I mean, I think when it comes to maybe girls football and people of determination, people with special needs, you know, I think yeah. more needs to be done. Um, you know, we're a pass. We're one of the few companies that put great significance on encouraging girls to play football. Yeah. Um, we've got girls teams, a girls program, and we work with Special Olympics and develop you know, people with, with uh, people of determination. Hmm. But I think it'd be good to get more people, more football organisations, more sporting organisations to also think about how they're providing opportunities for, for girls yeah. and for disadvantaged people, people of determination to be able to, to play sport. Um, so, you know, it can be inclusive. It is inclusive, but I think more can be done across the board, depending on where you're from. Yeah. I, th I think for, especially for like female sports and disability sports, it's a little bit harder because um, especially with disability sport, I think a lot of people, um, I spoke to a coach and he mentioned that previously he was a bit nervous about engaging with disabled people and knowing the right things to say because mm -hmm. it's, sometimes it can feel a bit like you're treading on very thin ice yeah, and yeah. everybody. Um, but pr you want to provide the best coaching that fits everybody's needs. You do. And also you've got to look at, I mean, the UK is a bit more different because disability is part of the, the norm, if you like, here. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the UAE, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why the Special Olympics World Games, I don't know if you're aware of it, was, was brought yeah. to the UAE in 2019. It was more to say, look, you know, don't 
be worried if your child has special needs you know yeah. bring them out in the open because there's a lot of pride involved and also worry that you know if people see that my child is special needs it means that they'll think my whole family has a stigma yeah. or there's an issue with it so there's there's a lot of barriers to be able to create opportunities for people with special needs in the UAE but Special Olympics has helped and I think you know it's hopefully getting better there's still some but definitely a lot more kind of open when it comes to special needs so no long way to continue yeah i mean it's going in the right direction and at least you know you're raising awareness and helping people have that confidence to take part because i think a lot of people do feel a bit held back sometimes because of their yeah. disability they feel like they won't be respected or included as much i don't know if you have any advice for a disabled um, athlete who wants to get involved but feels a little bit anxious about that i think it's just just start I think it's it's very difficult because I think if you're nervous, you won't ever start and you'll always think about it. But sometimes the truth is actually a lot easier than, than you know, than what you think it might be. So mm. I think, you know, with support from, you know, families or whatever, just just start, even if it's individually, just going out for a walk yourself or you know, go to the park with a friend or family member. Yeah. Usually in 99% of the time, you know, the people that you encounter will be sympathetic or be supportive. Um, but it's about just making that step out the front door and, and getting, giving it a go. And, you, you know, you realise that reality is actually a lot better than you know, the perception. Mm. Yeah, I think that's one of the problems to have the perception around disability. Um, it's a, it is it does kind of put people off. Because they think everyone holds these kind of stigmas. But actually, especially in like the football field of things, people are pretty open minded and they just want everyone to get involved, really. Is probably yeah, yeah. Yeah, huge. I think education, education here is, is, has been good. I think, you know, in the UK, especially when it comes to educating people, especially needs, and educating people about special needs. You know, you've got walking football, you've got, you know, blind football, you've got loads of opportunities for everyone. So, and it maybe it comes down to cost in the, the day with the local councils and what they can afford to put on. But at least there's opportunities there for people and it's open, which is... Yeah, exactly. Um, and I was also wondering, so what drove you to found the Proactive Soccer School? A mixture of luck and passion, really, to be honest. Uh, you know, I moved to the UAE in 2009 as a teacher. Um, I was coaching back in England. I was doing some bits for Chelsea. And then I was, in the summer, I was going to America. And then I started some stuff with Man United. So I always wanted to be with people, with kids, and help them develop and coach yeah. them and support their development. Um, so when I got to the UAE, I found that there was a bit of a gap in the market for the age groups that I like working with, the three to six-year-olds. So I started something alongside the Man United coaching that I was doing. Um, and then it just kind of built up from there, really, you know, three to six-year-olds and then went up to, you know, three to seven-year-olds. And year upon year, we got bigger and bigger. We started with, like, you know, 35 kids in 2000, 45 kids in 2010. Yeah. And now we're about 1,200 weekly participants in various occasions and various levels. And I think it's just lucky that I found the right people, yeah, the right coaches to, to be able to realise the, the values and the vision that I had and it wasn't like I set out to run a coaching company. It was just set out to do something I love doing. Yeah. And we just got bigger and bigger. And then it turned into a company. So maybe it's a little bit different in that people kind of set out to say, I want to have a company. I want to have this, 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 this. Where I was like, I just want to do something for the community, do something for the kids. And then eventually we kind of went yeah. the other way. So like I said, just passion and, and luck really to be yeah. in the right place at the right time. <laughs> Sounds like that. It's pretty fortunate, especially like finding like-minded people and like the coaching set start things that you know want the same thing as you. I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, um, huge. <laughs> um, do you th- just t- talking about COVID? Because obviously that's kind of had a big impact on yeah. like, sports in general. Like some people have said it's a good impact; it's got people out a bit more. Other people have said it's not because it's it's made them anxious and cautious to go outdoors. So I was just kind of wondering if you think it will have any sort of significant impact on people's will to exercise, either in the positive or negative side of things. I think it'll have a massive impact. I think I mean I look at our situation in the UAE where in March they stopped everything. You know, sport yeah. stopped. You know, school was closed and you know between march and end of july it was all kind of home learning you know kids couldn't do any sport couldn't go out it was all kind of locked down for a while um and you consider that prior to that especially from especially in the uae where the weather is so good between january and march april everyone was out you know people were doing you know football three four times a week you know five six hours a week you've got you know rugby tennis netball you know swimming everyone was doing sport and then suddenly stopped so I think the impact on the children, is especially, I think it's a huge impact. I, I, mm. I believe that this impact will not be felt for a good few years yet because the mental side of things of being around people and, you yeah. know, being sporty and, and exercising and suddenly have nothing and then kind of being at home 
uh, you know, on a computer, to, you know, eating whatever, not exercising because there's no motivation. The physical side of, of, of that as well, you know, you know, you're not doing anything and mostly you're putting on weight. Um, it's, a, it's a massive, massive issue. Uh, even the UAE now, even, you know, down the line, we're what, in nearly what, middle of August now, we still can't play team sports, still no football, still no rugby, yeah. so kids can't do much. You know, they can play individual sports, uh, which is fine, but mm. it's just it's just an excuse for them not to do anything. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. When, when, once we're back, I think it'll be maybe two, three years of kind of backwards, if you like, because then the kids need to... I mean, you see, I mean I've seen a few kids around and you've seen how much weight they've put on yeah. in a short time and, you know, you speak to parents and like, I can't get my kid to, to do anything. You know, we at Pass, we do a lot of online engagement, you know, do like a skills competition and try to get the kids to, you know, we're doing the thing right now with Special Olympics UAE where we're doing the thing where they have to try to get everyone to walk 52 million kilometres in 10 days, for example. So we've, we've kind of taken that to our kids and we said, join our team, we're all going to do it together. So we're trying to do as much as we can Yeah. and people do join in, but at the end of the day, you know, you can understand we're kind of looking at it, like, oh, I just don't, I just can't be bothered because mm-hmm. there's, there's just that, that impetus to get out and do something that's not there. So... No, I, I think, think it's, it's affected effect. everybody like in that way. It's like taking everyone's routine away and yeah. you kind of realise just how long you spend indoors. A lot yeah. made me realise that for sure. I'm trying yeah, to get massively. as much as I can. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's um and we've got we've got two kids ourselves and we've been lucky enough to we had a gardener so we could take them out and you yeah. know, get up early and do something with them. But even then it wasn't enough, you know, and you you always batting against the technology, you know, go off the iPad, do this, do this, do this. And parents who were lucky enough that obviously in a in lucky way, without football being there, I was able to be able to help the kids with the schoolwork and going out. But when you consider parents that are both working from home, how do they then give their kid the time to, how do they put the time to get the kids out to do sport or to get the kids out to do something? So yes. then the kids do what? They just spend all day on their iPads and their PS4s or whatever, and it just kind of builds up. So it's, it's a difficult time for everyone and it's no one's fault, but it's just a tough, yeah. tough time. You can't be helped. I mean, how, how would you say that with the Proactive Soccer School, how are you going to sort of ease back in to like doing football together again? Like how are you going to exercise caution and what have you to keep everybody safe and responsible well yeah we've got we've got procedures in place um as best as we can do based on government um you know advice in terms of you know the distancing and the programs and i can't imagine us doing any contact sport but we can no. do a lot of like a ball mastery stuff a lot of individual things but the only thing we can do is to maintain a positive attitude when the kids come yeah. trying to make it as fun for them and, and football is easy enough that you can't differentiate the levels depending on players and also depending on, on what you can do with the contact or non-contact um and like i said we've got everything ready we've got facilities ready we've got our, our procedures and policies in place mm. we just need to go ahead and then we can get stuff started to to get the kids out we're desperate to get yeah. going you know the kids are desperate parents are desperate no, we're just not. waiting for the for the green light mm. it's just kind of down to people being responsible i think and i think with sport you can, it's kind of worrying because I'm, like you want people to all exercise the caution correctly and follow the procedures but but i think with like you know like team sports people get excited people kind of forget that what's going yeah. on um, when they're celebrating or and it, it can be a bit of a risk yeah it's yeah, i can imagine i mean that i think all organizations like us what we can do is just make sure that everyone is aware you know we've got the the, the, the graphics in place got the videos yeah. you know we've kind of got the disclaimers and we've got people that we've got the setup is, is geared to make sure that people are aware of it mm-hmm. and i mean that there's a massive difference between the uk and the uae in that UAE is very much, you know, COVID first, safety first, masks, the social distance. Whereas, I mean, I've been here for the last two weeks now in England. I'm in England now. And the difference is huge. You know, you, you go out to the park and no one's wearing masks and yeah. you go to shopping centres. And yeah, they've got the, the barriers in place and everything. But you can tell that people don't take it as seriously. No. You know. no. But, it's, it's, and but on the flip side, at least people can do stuff you know my kids can play yeah. sport here they can go and they can go football training they can mm. you know they can be normal in that in that sense whereas in the uae they can't so it's yeah it's a balance and who knows where that that balance that pinch point lies um, but it's very interesting to see the two different yeah. ways of managing it responded differently and some people have been more cautious than others but england's been a little bit up and down with the whole country, yeah i'd say um but yeah it's definitely good that they, people can get outside they, just as long as they stay safe and it's yeah. down to them um and obviously you're mentioning that you did like a lot of online engagement while this is all going on um Mm -hmm. i think it's it's really great especially for like you know kids because they're getting quite tech savvy nowadays so it's kind of sports mixed with tech and i was just kind of wondering like do you think that more companies and 
like sport groups should be taking advantage of this methods of engagement? I think I think they should, and I think they will. I think you know yeah. this has given everyone a taste of what is to come, and the companies need to be more agile and kind of pivot a little bit to to mm. provide both sides. I mean, with football, it's a little bit difficult because yeah. it just becomes an individual skill program, if you like, you know, and it works. But you know, things like you know your fitness clubs and that. And uh, you know, and those kind of things, it's it's perfect for online. Yeah. People can do their, their workouts at home and have a, a, an instructor kind of take them through it. So, mm. I think you know, there's there's stuff you can do. Um, you know, with us, like I said, we we, we did um, a Euro 2020 skills competition where kids, you know, yeah. we gave the kids skills and then they had to execute these these, these skills and then send in videos. And I think that's what you can do: make it competition based. You know, make it game based. In level one, level two, level three, basically link it to as much to the video games they play as possible. Yeah, yeah. And that that's that's the kind of way forward. In, in in trying to get them engaged and trying to keep them involved in it in you know, varying levels of difficulty and you know points or that kind of stuff. No, yeah, like, it's, it's quite it's quite similar to the games that kids are playing nowadays. I think that's yes. good for sure. And it keeps yeah. motivated and everyone's in it together, which I think is really important for sports in general, just to have that sort of togetherness and that unity. Yeah, for sure. So I kind of just wanted to end on the thing, going back to the topic of mental health. And I was just mm-hmm. kind of um, wondering why you might encourage individuals with poor mental health to try grassroots sport as a means of coping. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, you know, sport is important. Um, and in my view, sport is crucial for everyone. Yeah. I mean, the benefits of sport are endless, especially during his lean time. For example, you know, look at myself. I mean, anyone that knows me knows how much I hate running. I can't stand just running. Mm-hmm. Running for no reason. I'm just like, what's the point? If it's a football, I'll run all day for it. But I'm just yeah. running for no reason. I don't get it. But lockdown came. I had no option. There's nothing else to do. So I had to get my trainers on and get outside. Mm-hmm. And it's the only thing that I could do to maintain some sanity. So myself, the wife and kids, we used to go and do it. And I think it's a case of, look, you know, this is a situation where you might not get what you want. You might not be able to do your favourite sport. You might not be able to, to engage with the favourite people or the people that you like to do with. But yeah. you have to do something. Anything is better than nothing when it comes to sport. And, you know, whether it's going out for a walk, going out running or, you know, going outside and you know, watching YouTube videos and then going out and practicing yeah. the skills or whatever, I think it's important. And um, until things are back to normal, you've got to do what you can do. And then when things are back to normal, it's, it's key that, especially if you've got poor mental health, to really get involved with team stuff and, and with sport because the benefits on the brain, you know, after minutes of walk you know you start returning and dopamine and everything else that the chemicals yeah. in the brain it's huge um and you you won't get it apart from doing something physical mm. so i think maybe the education needs to be clear clearer and say look you know this is what doing sport actually does for you you know this is how it helps your brain work this is how it helps your body and then you know it's a case of just parents doing their bit to support their kids um, and you know parental support and parent involvement is huge here because they spend more time with the kids than anyone else especially these yeah. times and it's you know it's setting that example and then giving opportunities for parents to go out with the kids or you know, allowing the kids to go out and just basically sending them outside in the garden locking the door saying don't come out for another hour you know eventually they'll so they're outside enough time they'll find something to do you know um it's just just simple things like that that is, is, is key and is important for for everyone to adopt so yeah that's what that's what they have to do that's that's really important mm. no yeah definitely i mean if, as long as people incentivize sport and make it fun i think i think kids will, will take up on that, especially while the weather's so nice yeah you know? yeah. <laughs> that too. Make, make the most of, yeah you know what i mean like in the uae right now it's 40 50 degrees so you can't do anything there so you're kind of stuck indoors but in the uk it's there's no excuse really it's just, just no. get out that's it so so yeah well, that's that's what i hope that we get people to do yeah well, thank you so much for chatting to me. Um, no problem. It was really good. And uh, I hope you have a nice uh, rest of your day. <laughs> thank you. You too. All right. Thanks for your time. Bye. Bye-bye.